and welcome to today's episode of Tales from the Field. Today we're going to be talking about tundra animals. Animals that live in the tundra are some of the toughest animals given the climate conditions that they have to survive. Today we'll talk about the different types of tundra environments and the animals that inhabit them. Then we'll talk about some of the different ways that you can get involved with them if you're interested in working with them. I've included some links to day in the life type videos of professionals working with different types of tundra animals, as well as an interview with an Iditarod musher at the end of today's video. Make sure to stay tuned for today's video's secret code, as with each video in our Tales from the Field series, you can earn points and badges for our 2021 Tales and Tales Summer Reading Program. To learn more about our Summer Reading Program, cl click on the link in the description box below. The tundra environment is derived from the Finnish word tunturia, which means barren or treeless hill. Characteristics of the tundra biome include extremely cold climates, low biotic diversity, and a lot of the nutrients and energy that support um, the life there comes from dead organic materials in the ground. There's a lot of very simple uh, vegetation as there is a very short season of growth and reproduction in the um, summer. Uh, because of these conditions, there are a lot of animals that migrate. So this causes the population in uh, tundras to uh, oscillate and change fairly frequently. Now there are two types of tundra biomes. The first is the Arctic tundra. So the Arctic tundra is located in the Northern Hemisphere. It starts at the North Pole and extends south to the taiga forests. Now we talked about taiga forests in last week's video um, in forest animals. So if you'd like to learn more about the taiga forest, check out last week's video, which I've linked in the description box below. So the Arctic is known for its cold, desert-like conditions. The growing season in the Arctic is very short, lasting only 50 to 60 days, so maybe about a month and a half to two months. The animals that inhabit the Arctic tundra include carnivorous mammals like Arctic wolves, foxes, and polar bears. You'll also find herbivores such as uh, lemmings, uh, voles, caribou, arctic hares and squirrels, and migratory birds um, such as the arctic tern, uh, puffins, uh, various species of gulls, falcons, loons, ravens, as well as other fish such as cod, flatfish, salmon, and trout. Now Animals in the Arctic are going to be adap adapted to handle long, cold winters, and they breed and raise their young very quickly in the summer because of that really short growing period. So the animals that are mammals and birds also have additional insulation in the form of fat. A lot of these animals will also hibernate during the winter because food is not abundant during that time. A lot of the birds will migrate south in the winter, and you won't find many reptiles or amphibians because of those cold temperatures. The second type of tundra biome is the alpine tundra. The alpine tundra is going to be located on mountains throughout the world that are at really high altitudes, um, and trees can't grow at that high. So the ecosystem will start at about 11,000 feet up, um, depending on the exposure, according to the National Park Service. The nighttime temperature in the alpine will drop below freezing. Um, now, because this is at night, the growing season is a little bit longer than the Arctic tundra. So it'll, it's about six months or 180 days. 
And also unlike the Arctic tundra, the soil in the alpine biome is going to be uh, better drained, but the plants are going to be very similar with simple vegetation and low diversity. Animals in the alpine tundra um, includes lots of mammals like pikas, marmots, mountain goats, sheep, and elk. You'll also find grouse-like birds, as well as insects um, such as springtails, beetles, grasshoppers, and butterflies. Now these animals develop a number of adaptations in order to survive the winter. Um, some will eat all summer long, then hibernate throughout the winter, and then others will go through phenological changes to survive the winter, such as growing an all-white winter coat to better camouflage themselves. Others will move between the tundra and taiga biomes throughout the year to follow the food and um, the more appropriate temperatures. Now, there are, are many different ways to get involved with these type of animals. A lot of resources will say that you need a science heavy background to work with animals. And while this is true, if you're interested in medicine or studying uh, the biology or chemistry in a species, there are a lot more to these career pathways than just being good at biology and chemistry. Don't forget that there are also social science aspects to study as well. And when working with animals, there are, also, there are medical, administrative, technical, outreach, and education roles to fill as well. Some good places to look uh, for job postings, uh, whether or not you're ready to apply for them, um, you can look at them to bookmark them and get a better idea of what sort of education or experience you need. Local, state, or federal governments have opportunities with animal agriculture, animal control, environmental science, and within the park systems. Colleges and universities are also great resources if you're interested in research or academics. Within veterinary medicine, there are a variety of um, different animals you can work with, such as domestic animals, exotic animals, wildlife, and livestock. There are also nonprofit organizations that focus on rescue, rehabilitation, and advocacy for different types of animals. Other bis private businesses can work with wildlife removal, education, and husbandry. If you're interested in research, um, you can study a specific species of animals within academics or with a sponsoring agency. Um, you can also apply for a grant to cover any expenses or join a pre-existing excursion. You can also get involved with rehabilitation as there are rescues dedicated to caring for injured animals. If you're interested in education, it can be done in formal or informal settings, such as in the classroom or in the field, working with either experts or just curious families. And if you're interested in conservation, there are a number of organizations that are dedicated to caring for animals who would be vulnerable if left in the wild. So thinking beyond zoo enclosures, there are a number of sanctuaries for animals who can't take care of themselves for a variety of reasons. If you want to learn more about tundra animals, I've included a couple of great day in the life type videos in the description box below. The first is a video with sled dogs and park rangers protecting the Denali National Park in Alaska. The park covers more than 6 million acres in the interior Alaska area. I've also included a video uh, with Arctic, uh, interviewing Arctic scientists who study the Arctic ground squirrel. And stay tuned for an interview clip with an Iditarod musher who discusses how she uses her sled dogs to help scientists collect and analyze uh, reindeer data. So today's secret code for our summer reading program is Tundra Tales. So make sure you log that in your summer reading lock to earn points and badges. I look forward to seeing you guys next week and we'll be talking about grassland animals. So have a great day and make sure you stay tuned for the interview with the Iditarod Musher. Hi.
grandfather, he was born in Greenland and grew up with sled dogs and, you know, would tell me about that when I was a kid. And he did that. Uh, he was Danish, but his dad, um, my great grandfather, he opened up the first uh, meat search station in the Arctic. And that was in Greenland in um, 1906. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and then my, my grandfather was born at the research station in Greenland and, and lived there until he was late teens, I think, mid-teens. And, um, and so I just grew up absolutely fascinated by everything Arctic and the sled dogs and really had no basis for it, if you want to put it that way. But uh, I then uh, eventually, when I was 18, I went on my first expedition in, um, in Canada for uh, two and a half months of a uh, little over 2,000 mile expedition with Will Steger out of Minnesota. And, um, and on that trip, I just, I mean, if I wasn't already hooked, um, that just became ab absolutely everything to me. And it wasn't just the dogs. I mean, the essence of it all for me and from my experience and from my love of it is the dogs and, and the experience of running dogs across big expanses of land. Um, I get incredible satisfaction from that. But on top of that, I came to realize um, that I was just I was so comfortable and I was so, it felt so familiar. Um, and it was such an amazing experience for me to travel along the trail, meeting people, locals, um, and being in this environment. And when I was done with the expedition, um, it was like I, I mean, I, I compared to like how they felt when they went to the moon the first time. It was just like, I mean, I couldn't stop smiling. I couldn't understand why, I mean, I was 18. I was like, I couldn't understand why the whole world wasn't smiling all the time. And I just felt this instant, um, like I owed a lot to the people I'd met and to the, to this environment and to the, it sounds really weird, but, and to the natives. And I wanted to, you know, immerse myself in some sort of, um, sharing that and the beauty of this place and the people that live there with the world. Introspectively, uh, do you think that that charted your life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the first expedition that I did, we started out in Winnipeg and we ran basically from the southern border of Canada to uh, little to Yellowknife, um, which is not all the way north up to the Arctic Ocean, but it's up there. And, um, and, and it was a bizarre experience because my, my grandfather's brothers, um, they were quite a bit older. He was, the, he was born late. Um, they were like 12 and 15 years older than him uh, and obviously grew up in Greenland. Um, they actually immigrated from Greenland to Canada where they were hired. This is weird, but they were hired uh, by a company out of Chicago to move reindeer from um, Nome to the Mackenzie River Delta in Canada. And, and they weren't really the ones who were supposed to do that. They were supposed, they were both botanists like my great grandfather. And they were supposed to go out and basically dog sled all over the Canadian and Alaskan North. Uh, dog sled in the wintertime and uh, go by canoe in the summertime and find the best possible route, grassing route to move these reindeer. And then they were supposed to hire Sami out of uh, um, Scandinavia, out of Norway and Finland and Sweden uh, to come over and actually move the reindeer. And uh -huh. funny enough, my granddad, who was like 14 at the time, he was the one who went and hired the Sami. Um, and uh, then they, my, my great uncles, they uh, built the reindeer station in Mackenzie River Delta and outside of Tokchiyoktok, between Tokchiyoktok and Nubik. And uh, and have some really crazy history from there. But I mean, the bottom line is they, they travel all over the place. They travel something like 26,000 miles over a, like, like a four year period to like basically map out the, the botany. And um, 
So as I went on this first expedition, I would run into people that would tell me, locals that would tell me, uh, your uncle helped my family. And I'm my, my uncle? I mean, I'm 18 and my name is a family name. My great grandfather came up with it when he was sitting in Greenland. Um, it means the, what's the porsa? Porse is a uh, cattail. And when he would sit in his office and look out, out over the swamp, basically, in front of his office, and when the sun would set, it looked like the cattails were on fire. And it means fire, so it means cattail fire, basically. So it's a family name, and, I, and I'm like, my uncle. I mean, my uncle is in Denmark. I mean, he definitely didn't help your family. I, I wasn't catching up to it, right? And we got to Yellowknife, and an incident happened with a dog and a little kid, and, and it was all very tense. And his family called up in the middle of the night and said that they wanted to talk to me. And everybody's like, you want to talk to the Dane? Okay. And so they took, got a hold of me, and, and this man is on the phone, and he's like, my family owes your family a favor. Your uncle. I'm like, my, oh, who is my uncle? You know, who is this guy everybody refers to? And he went ahead and told me. And the second he said the name, I was like, oh, my grand uncle, my great uncle, as you say in English. And uh, to all of a sudden make the connection that, that this was what my family had done and that I was traveling amongst people that we were connected, going back in time, was just absolutely amazing to come to realize. And then as I, the next, so that was in 92, 93, and for the next almost 20 years, I got to travel, you know, in Canada and all over Canada and in Greenland and Russia and, and in Scandinavia and Alaska, by dog team. And not only was it the connection of people, because along the way we would, I would have people ride on our sleds. And so, you know, I'd be in Alaska and then we'd go to Russia and people, family members that hadn't seen each other for 10, 15 years would see each other's names on the sled or between communities in Canada. Um, so, you know, I, I got to experience firsthand the connection of people. Um, and then, the, as you said, the language, the culture, I mean, that's what our education program was about. So I got to connect that and all the research I had to do with that. And I got to experience it firsthand. And of course, the environment and the tradition around sled dogs. And so, yes, it, it's what drew me in to begin with. And it's definitely what kept me fired up and still has me fired up.